everybody, and welcome, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Lane the Auctionista, and I'm so excited that today has finally arrived. In the next hour, we are going to investigate and unlock the critical steps that the Georgian Bay Hospital Foundation uh, took. They to toppled the status quo. They converted two of their in-person events into one massively successful virtual gala called the Power of Giving Virtual Gala. It's going to be a great show. So right now, I want to introduce to you my fabulous co-host, Nicole, Nicole Kraftcheck. Nicole is the executive director of the Georgian Bay General Hospital Foundation, responsible for the philanthropic mission and the administration of the foundation. With over 11 years of progressive fundraising and not-profit experience, Nicole's specialties include operations management, partnership relationship management, <laughs> corporate giving, major gifts, and legacy giving. Hey! Nicole, isn't it great to be back at the MTAV Virtual Studios right here in Barrie, Ontario? This is where all the magic of the Power of Giving Virtual Gala happened. I know, Lane. It absolutely is. Um, and it's great to see you, and it's great to see all of you today as well. So welcome to everybody, and thank you for joining. Lane, when you and I began planning today's learning event, we both felt really strongly that we really wanted this to be a tell-all. So with that in mind, we are opening our book and the conversation will be 100% focused on how we achieved virtual event success. So, folks, we will be taking your questions on the chat function, so make sure you uh, put your questions in there, and then we're going to have a full case study available for you, and everyone registered today was automatically entered into a, a draw taking place at the end of the event. The prize is one hour with Lane and myself, and you get to talk all things virtual gala. You know, that, that's going to be pretty awesome, and I'm excited about that. But I really want to get started. we got, we got to kick this thing up and get going. So, Nicole, as the director, the executive director of the foundation, I know participants are super eager to hear from you. I mean, there really would have been a lot riding on your decision to boldly move forward into this virtual gala. Specifically, there was a quarter of million dollars of annual <laughs> revenue riding on it. Um, and back early in the summer, this virtual gala thing was a very unknown entity. So I'm sure that you took into consideration very carefully stakeholder accountability, your fiscal responsibility. So now uh, I'm going to hand it over to you to like open up the books, <laughs> tell the story, um, and let's talk about some of the major considerations and decisions that were made. Yeah, so of course. So first, I would really like to comment on how important I do think the spirit of collaboration and community is now more than ever. The idea that we are bringing everyone together today to show what can happen when we all work together, as we did for this virtual event, is absolutely amazing. And I really do think that there is so much power in that. But you folks are all participating so that you can hear the good stuff, the meat and potatoes, the deep dive. So let's get into that. Let's dive into the budget. So you will see on the slide deck our comparison of what we budgeted for our two in-person events for 2021. You compare that to what our actuals were for the Power of Giving Virtual Gala. The numbers very clearly outline that we spent less money in this virtual space, but we spent more money on just like a few key items, and I'm going to dive into that a little bit more. So these line items, one of them is videography. You know, it's funny, when we um, were planning our fiscal year back in January 2020, almost a year ago, I commented to the team at the foundation uh, that I wanted to incorporate more video. And I guess that was a gift of COVID for us. We knew that video was going to give our messaging longevity and help people connect deeper with our mission. Tech was another line item. So we had spent money on AV and tech in the past, of course, in uh, our in-person events, but tech for virtual is absolutely different. Professional host and professional fundraising auctioneer. In the past, our foundation events had their token spokespeople that we all call, called upon to host our events. As we planned for fiscal 2021 back in January, again, the team knew that we wanted to move in a bit of a different direction for those upcoming events. So I remember being extremely disappointed 
when we had reached out to Lane originally and they were already booked for those in-person dates uh, that we were looking at for 2020. Um, and so again, another gift of COVID, we were able to secure Lane and bring them on board as part of our virtual event. And now moving forward, we will be using Lane absolutely as our fund and need and host um, because in our opinion, honestly, we would not have it any other way. This does come at a cost, but is absolutely worth every single penny. The entire budget breakdown will, of course, be provided in the case study for all of you to access. But let's expand that a little bit further on some of the other budget items. So our overall goal was $250,000, 180000 of that was in auction and in donations. We had $70,000 budgeted for sponsorship. We raised going into the event 74,500 in sponsorship, 135,000 was in that fund and need, those pre-committed gifts, and then that really translated to about 84% going into event night. And I think a few other key notables that are worth mentioning is we acquired 62 new donors. So from a donor acquisition perspective, absolutely awesome. Eight of the 18 Power of Giving virtual gala sponsors were brand new sponsors to our events um, and had not participated in the gala or pops before. Eight of the 17 sponsors did not return actually from the 2019 gala event and seven of the nine sponsors from the gala 20 or the pops 2019 also did not return. So in the next slide, um, what I do think our participants and, and you folks will find interesting data is that our organic gifts that came in the night of the event. So you can see, see in the slide deck, it's a gift chart. We had $67,000 come in organically that night. The average gift size was $741. Seven of those gifts represented 57% of the $67,000. We had a $10,000 gift. We had three $5,000 gifts. We had 14 $1,000 gifts. And this really speaks to the intentional flow of the event. There was deliberate planning of key moments like patient stories and uh, keeping that audience engaged. And it also speaks to Lane and their ability to elevate the mission and draw out those inspirational gifts. You absolutely do not want to miss those opportunities within your virtual event. And I just need to give a good shout out to um, our team member, Katherine Johnson. She was instrumental behind the scenes in all of this as she was the one entering all the data and doing so much of the administration. Although not front and center, uh, we absolutely cannot underestimate the importance of those roles in our organization. So thank you, Katherine. And now let's get into some other overarching items that helped us navigate um, this new event format. So, Naming, this is our branding. What was the focus of our event going to be? Was it in line with our brand? Would sponsors and the community feel engaged? We wanted it focused on giving. We needed to stand out and be recognizable. We wanted to partner with one of our local graphics specialists so that we could seek to serve that business community. Content. Professional show host, professional fundraising host, and auctioneer. As I mentioned previously, a huge part of our success was the addition of Lane. We were not going to risk any part of the flow of the show or the fundraising. And as for content, this was a must-have. Lane surrounds the credibility and heart of the patient stories with that elevated impact and empathy that builds throughout the event. So this surrounded each patient story and was absolutely very intentional. Let's talk patient stories. We knew from all of our research that we wanted high quality, well-produced patient stories. We had never invested in this for the foundation and we knew that these would be an investment and live on past this virtual event and support our cause. And we ensured that these were heartfelt and very purposeful and very well-produced. A few other key mentionables, brand video, sponsors, how they were going to be featured, how-to demonstrations to register, bid, and donate, online auction, entertainment. Um, all speakers needed to be mission-focused, bloopers and credits, and of course, the length of the entire production. We're going to get into this a little bit later in the show. And as the leader, 
of um, the organization, I wanted to be very involved. So these are some other considerations. Um, and I was involved in every development meeting along the way. Well, almost every meeting. The staff all needed to work together and understand their roles in the execution of the event, which was definitely different than their typical event roles. The other thing, I didn't want there to fee be a fee to participate. We focused our committee and both the hospital and the foundation boards to help with registration and what we called audience development. We had contests to see who could send it out to the most people and get the most people registered. Our goal going in was to have 400 registered guests going into event night. A few other notables uh, that I'd like to comment on include the alignment with our local restaurants. We really wanted to seek to serve our local business community at a time when it was really, really important. So we aligned with our local restaurants for the pre-auction uh, for revenue generation. This encouraged supporters to have a watch party within the guidelines and be able to eat together. We also were not prepared to venture to arrange for those watch party meals as I wanted to keep the focus on revenue generation generation tasks, such as the pre-committed gifts, sponsorship, and of course the auction items. So with all of this, we also had restaurants come on board to offer meals for the night of the event. Supporters could just order themselves and pick up the day of the event, and all coordination was done with those individual restaurants, um, taking that logistical task away from the board or staff or volunteers. This strategy drove people to our auction site further in advance, creating a ton of activity and engagement, and of course gave them some retail therapy at a time when they craved it with COVID. Again, we also looked at um, securing a major gift for impact and analyzing to uh, ensure that we could raise at least 75% going into event night. Lane? That was a mouthful. Well, so yeah, now it's it, your turn. <laughs> it, it sure was. And that was a lot of information. So now we're going to move right into the next segment. Uh, you're going to watch an interview with Christine Bagley, who's going to talk turkey about sponsorship and fun and eat. Christine Bagley is the philanthropy officer at Georgian Bay General Hospital Foundation. Her role is responsible for the acquisition of major gifts for capital equipment purchases at GBGH. An aggressive goal of $250,000 was set for the Power of Giving Virtual Gala. An extension of that goal was to secure 75% in advance in both sponsorship and seed gifts. Christine's role was instrumental in securing this revenue. Christine, when GBGH decided to move boldly forward with the Virtual Gala, what were your initial thoughts around achieving your sponsorship goals and what were your immediate concerns? Right. So my immediate thoughts went to how our business is going to support us in such uncertain times. I was not normally afraid to ask for gifts, but given the landscape of the environment at the time, I was a little apprehensive to actually ask for support. Um, then I was trying to wrap my head around how do we get $80,000 worth of sponsorships into a short time frame of 45 minutes? I can completely understand that. So Christine, how did you change or alter the sponsor levels and or benefits uh, from your in-person event to now this virtual event? So creativity was key. We looked at opportunities for exposure and added a value to that sponsorship package. We broke out the entire 45 minutes of the event into minute by minute to capture every opportunity. We needed to look at pre and post event recognition, and we did keep the same values as our signature events, but we changed the names to be synonymous with the power of giving. We also offered our higher tier sponsorships, uh, a promo video that was used in social media and our websites throughout the event pre and post. So Christine, in the end, what was the final sponsorship outcome and what key learning did you come away with regarding sponsorship response and supporting a virtual event? So we raised $74,500 out of our $80,000 goal. With a face-to-face -face event, we know how many people are attending, we know who is attending, and we know what the area of recognition opportunities are within that space. Going into our first virtual gala, we didn't have that benchmark. Our event was free, it was online, and it was only 45 minutes. But after the event aired, we quickly realized that the 
recognition given to the sponsors was extraordinary. On this platform, we were able to market to a diverse demographic who had different income levels. And because there were no monetary boundaries to that event, it was free. I feel like our sponsors actually got a bigger bang for their buck. And uh, with that exposure, we had given them. All right, so let's dig in to the major gifts for the Fund and Eat. We plan two live fundraising segments and a very lofty fundraising goal inside of our 45-minute virtual event. Our goal was to raise $180,000 in donations. So when I think of an in-person event, we know how many people are going to be in the room. We can forecast the number of gifts and the gift levels based on historical data. You know, one of the coaching strategies that I offer my clients is to secure 40% in seed money for an in-person fund and need. But for the virtual gala, I recommended securing 75% in fund and need seed money. I mean, you all gulped a little bit, but in the end, the GBGH team secured $135,000 in pre-committed gifts. That's 75% of our goal. I mean, that is absolutely incredible. Uh, Christine, tell us how you went about securing those seed donations. We looked at the attendees of our past signature events and their giving history. These are folks who have attended our events, have spent money on a live auction item, and also have been uh, given meaningful gifts. Uh, we started to have conversations with these folks first. Uh, securing the matching gift really gave us leverage to have a meaningful conversation. We also looked at current pipeline of prospects to ensure that we were getting distinct giving levels, and also um, getting on the phone with these people was key. Conversations were crucial. Uh, the more I got on the phone and had these conversations, the more comfortable I started feeling for asking for the gift. Christine, so true. Those direct and personal phone calls are everything. So tell us, how did the process and experience of securing over-target seed money change or shift your fundraising mindset? Seed gifts are a vital component to the fund and need. It's imperative to know that you have leaders stepping up to inspire others to give, not only ensuring that you have the secured gifts, but also knowing that you have the audience that's gonna drive it home. The signature events that GBGH would host were always a crowd pleaser, but fell short on the fund and need portion. Our community has never been asked to support beyond their ticket price. So never underestimate the power of giving. It's infectious. People want to get on the bandwagon and when they see their families, their peers, their colleagues, their adversaries support, it, it just really adds power to the whole event. Don't I know it. It only takes a few to inspire many, doesn't it? Christine, you also secured a $50,000 match gift for the fun and need. I mean, wow. That meant that the first $50,000 raised was going to be instantly doubled. Um, and that is a great accomplishment for any charity, but for a first time virtual gala and a first time fund to need, that is simply incredible. So congratulations with that. This was going to be the first time that this community, your donors and audience would have been exposed to this fundraising approach. So tell us about the match gift and the positive effect of that major donation. When COVID hit, we got on the phones immediately to connect with our donors. So those early conversations were crucial. We started the conversation with Alan and Allison Fryer in the early summer about what we needed to accomplish and the vision of this event um, and how a gift would inspire a level of giving that we knew we had to get to. Our conversation started with a $25,000 gift, but after they learned about our aggressive goal of $250,000, they quickly realized that the, a $50,000 gift would make a bigger impact. Our relationship with the Friars has strengthened immensely because they know we have the credibility that when we say something, they know we're going to do it. They were a part of fundraising history in our community. Congratulations. I mean. 
fabulous results, incredible teamwork, and incredible focus. Um, I, I knew as soon as I started working with the GBGH team that failure was never going to be an option. And I love that positive attitude because it can actually shift everything. So Christine, the last word goes to you. What was your greatest aha moment? There really is power in giving. Lane, you set us up to a fund a need and we sat back and watched it flourish. We weren't all in a ballroom together, but watching those names across the screen of familiar donors, I couldn't help but feel so connected to every person sitting in the comfort of their own home, all experiencing the same magic I was feeling. I think I can speak for the entire committee who all watch distantly as well, that were in that moment, we had accomplished something so far beyond our expectations, and we couldn't be more proud to have been a part of that experience together. Oh my God, the hairs on my neck just stood up. I mean, amazing, and congratulations. Christine, it's always a pleasure to talk fundraising with you. Thank you so much for being with us today. All right, so Nicole, I just want to take a moment right now and just quickly reflect on Christine's words in that interview. The community has never been asked, never been asked to support beyond their ticket price. And watching the donor names scroll on screen, we knew we had accomplished something so far beyond our expectations. So Nicole, I am so grateful to, uh, to you, to the foundation team for, first of all, thank you for trusting in my fundraising strategy, but even greater is my respect to you. The, I, I'm really in awe, truly, how you all dug in so deep and um, accomplished what you did. So that's great. All right. So um, over the last couple of weeks, we have been receiving questions from you. And um, uh, Jody reached out to us and Jody asked, Lane, why are fund and need gifts so critical, especially in a virtual event? Well, Jody, um, these answers are for you and these answers are for everyone. Here's your top three reasons. Having seed money mitigates the risk of a fundraising shortfall. You know, at an in-person event, we know exactly how many people are going to be in a room. You heard that in the interview, data, historical data. But here's the thing, kids. Until you start rolling that show, you actually don't know how many viewers you are going to have online. And if you have nine people watching, there is simply nothing I can do, Nicole, to pull another quarter million dollars out of that. Jody, reason number two. When the names of those seed donors come up on screen, this really does inspire others and motivates them to follow suit. You know, it, it does create kind of this po positive peer pressure virtually. And it really proves that folks are coming together. They're there to give. They are coming online to support. And you know what? I also think that there is real value in recognizing some of those names. You know, friends, neighbors, local businesses all coming together. It really gives that real lovely feeling of community. Reason number three, <laughs> pre-committed donations drive that totalizer. That thermometer starts swinging up. That th thermometer that we see is very visual. That's very, very strong and it's dynamic. People love working towards a goal. So that visual thermometer shows the goal. We're reaching for that goal. It also accentuates the gap how much more how much more we have to do and it's something very very dynamic so while i'm reiterating the mission while i'm going after those donations you know that thermometer is swelling and rising and humming along and that just creates a lot of energy so now back over to you nicole what's coming up next for us yeah, so Jen Russell is the Development and Communications Coordinator for the Georgian Bay General Hospital Foundation, and I could not be more proud to have her on that small but mighty team that we have. So in this interview, you will hear from Lane and Jen on all things marketing and communications. Jen Russell is the Development and Communications Officer at the Georgian Bay General Hospital Foundation. In her role, Jen coordinates fundraising programs, manages events, and is responsible for all the communications for the foundation, from written proposals and fundraising materials to social media and everything in between. For the Power of Giving Virtual Gala, Jen was responsible for event production, marketing, and communications. She tackled the daunting tasks of creating an engaging run of show while ensuring the best viewer experience 
and developed a solid communication strategy to keep the whole community informed. Hey, Jen, welcome. And it's great to see you. And thank you so much for spilling the secrets on how you contributed uh, to the power of giving virtual gala. Um, I really want to start with the run of show. I mean, that was a very substantial undertaking, both creatively and logistically. Um, the run of show, I feel, is directly linked to the look the feel and the purpose of the event. So I knew that we literally could not move forward with production until the run of show was determined and nailed down. So tell us, Jen, how did you go about creating a dynamic, fast-paced, well-timed virtual event? And talk a little bit about the specific considerations and details you incorporated to ensure the best possible viewer experience. <laughs> Well, to start with, we really had no idea how to run a virtual event. Uh, so we began by watching as many virtual online events as we could find um, and worked as a team to really nail down the components we wanted for our event. The key things that we focused in on uh, were the pre-show, impactful videography, how-to videos for using the giving platform, entertainment, videos and transitions that really helped the event to feel live, and then of course our live fundraising segment. We wanted to leave as little as possible to chance, so we decided to pre-record the entire show, except, of course, for the live fundraising uh, fund need. For the pre-show, we focused on our how-to videos for the giving platform, uh, so our guests would be all set when they logged in and, and the show started, um, and then sponsor recognition. We didn't want our guests to miss out on any critical details if they tuned in right at showtime, um, but we also wanted to offer some value to those who tuned in early. The main show was definitely more challenging uh, to schedule, but we knew we wanted to create um, an impactful moment. So we started with a brand video to ensure that our audience really felt connected to the cause. We made the decision to invest in three impactful uh, videos, um, professional storytelling videos, if you will, um, a brand video and two patient stories, and ensured they were spaced out throughout the show. Uh, we paired our most powerful patient stories with the live fund and need segments, and at this point decided we needed two fund and need segments. It was the only way it was going to go. Uh, from there, we decided who we wanted to introduce those patient stories. Uh, we decided on Nicole Krafschik, our executive director, um, and then also the two chairs uh, for our volunteer committees. committee. Uh, these are recognizable faces for our community and for our donors, which was an important consideration. Uh, and we focus their messages in on why they're involved and then also on asking viewers to join them, to be part of the event. These little details are a big part of the viewer experience and retention, um, as we all like to see and hear from people that we know. Um, and that's a big reason why we also had headline entertainment from Chantal Kerbyazik. As we wound down the show, we knew we wanted to end on a lighthearted note. So we paired our closing credits with a short entertaining blooper reel um, followed by our final 15-minute view of the uh, auction leaderboard. Um, this really kept our viewers and audience engaged right till the end, so nobody missed out on anything, and it made sure they didn't turn the show off until it was really over. Thanks, Jen. And Honestly, congratulations, and I know how much time you invested uh, on the run of show, and congrats. I mean, really, really well done. So now we've got that virtual run of show lockdown. I, I know that we all felt that we were going to have a very well-produced event. Every segment was beautifully mission-connected. Christine and the virtual gala committee were actively working on fundraising, um, but next, we needed those eyeballs on event night. And we knew that without a sizable audience that there was a concern that we may not achieve our fundraising goals. Jen, uh, you developed and executed a very calculated and intentional audience development strategy through social media and marketing. Um, to be honest with you, it's probably one of the best promotional plans that I've ever seen. And folks watching today, uh, please creep the GBGH socials uh, and see why I am saying that. So Jen, when it came to the marketing and communications plan for the virtual gala, uh, how did you design this plan possibly differently than you would for your in-person gala, especially knowing that we needed 400 plus viewers on event night. The communication for the virtual gala was definitely a bit different uh, than an in-person event, but not maybe as much as you might think. One of the things that we did that was sort of unique that helped us keep our regular gala guests engaged um, was that we still sent out our traditional save the dates by mail, uh, giving everyone the opportunity to visit our site to learn more. 
When we dove into the rest of the communication plan, there was definitely a heavier emphasis on social media, email, and radio advertising than ever before. Uh, the focus for all of our pre-event communication was on getting people registered. This way, we captured their email address ahead of time, and we were able to send some targeted specific emails to that smaller audience who were already engaged uh, before the event. A key difference in the overall strategy for our social media was having teaser videos. Um, this really captured the attention of people, but it also because we used uh, familiar faces. These posts received loads of shares, which helped to get our uh, message in front of a way bigger audience than we would have uh, regularly. I think one of the key factors outside of communication plan for audience development was that our event was free. With so much online content and virtual events popping up, we really didn't want there to be any barriers to registration and to getting people to, uh, to engage and to, to log in. In the weeks leading up to the event, we monitored the registrations very carefully. Um, and we found that the day that the auction went live, we certainly saw an increase in numbers. Um, the days leading up to the event, there was certainly an increase. Um, and we were thrilled that we had just over 400 guests registered when we went live. I mean, I remember that. I mean, we almost popped the bubbly right then and there when we got to our 400 viewers. I mean, that was an incredible feeling and an incredible moment. So Jen, what are two important factors you feel charities should consider when they're thinking about their fundraising platform? The fundraising platform was really important for us. We wanted an engaging site where it was easy to people to log on and to explore, uh, but also had to have the capacity to integrate with our live fundraising segments. I would encourage charities, encourage charities to consider uh, whether the platform can provide effective recognition for your donors. Um, does it have a ticker tape or pop-up windows when someone makes a donation? Is it able to display a fundraising thermometer on the screen when you're doing your live fundraising segment? Um, I think it's also important for charities to consider how the fundraising technology will integrate with the vision you have for your overall event. Uh, does the platform allow for a seamless show experience? Uh, will your event be available to watch after it's over for other people to view it? Um, and how flexible is the platform if you choose to partner with a professional audiovisual company as we did? It was definitely tricky navigating all of these technical components, uh, but I would highly recommend investing the time to figure it out. It certainly made a world of difference for us. Jen, thank you so much. It has been so great chatting with you. Now folks, there was a lot of very useful information in that interview with Blaine and Jen. But when I think back to all of the time that we spent on the run of show, deciding what platform to use, logistically planning, all the filming and the marketing, Wow, it was definitely no small task, but was so, so important to that final outcome. So great job, Lane and Jen, on communicating all that messaging. So let's shift our gears to another topic, having a professional host and fundraising auctioneer. Lane's background as director of development in both the healthcare and arts and culture sectors brings with it a unique set of skills that you won't find in others in the profession. Lane brought with them critical pre-event fundraising strategies as well as guidance on every single aspect of our project. There was this incredible positivity that just like oozed out of them and transposed onto our team. So Lane, you know how deeply I feel about the level of expertise that you brought to the table. So let's talk about your role as host and fundraising auctioneer. So like, uh, now that I have watched you host our show, I can honestly say that it is a far more critical role than I ever thought. The host really is the backbone of a virtual event. So Lane, can you talk a little bit about some of your hosting secrets, what skills you brought to the virtual event, and what charities should be looking at when selecting a great host? Of course I can, and I can believe completely agree with you when you say that the host is the backbone of the show. They're the first impression and they are the final impression that everybody has. So, you know, a studio environment is very different than an in-person event. There, there, there's nobody here. There's a few people that are watching what is happening in front of the camera. It's quiet. There's no audience feedback. There's no two-way communication with body language and every twitch and facial expression is exploded upon. It 
it is observed by everybody watching the show. And I really truly believe that the host is integral to the tone of the event. They deliver key messaging. They are definitely supporting the fundraising aspects of your show. And they are part of the entertainment as well. So they are your ambassadors. So I believe that this particular role is going to impact the overall outcome of your show. And of course, a great host is not shy, not uncertain. Uh, they are camera friendly. They are ready to go. They are going to consider the diction, the cadence, the inflection, the tone. Um, and they want to make sure that every word that comes out of them carries maximum impact. Uh, for sure, there are times, Nicole, that a host has to be serious, but there are definitely times where a host has to be fun. And, you know, I do most of my, well, probably all of my hosting script writing myself. And so when I am preparing this and creating this, I am looking to take our viewers on an emotional journey through the show. This keeps folks engaged. Um, it, it, uh, it is an undulating emotions that are coming out. And, you know, for example, Example, you know, when we're preparing to go into that patient story, we definitely have to switch the tone so that the audience understands something's shifting, something's changing. So, you know, for me, I think the more energy that an online host has, the more chance of uh, your audience staying engaged, staying right to the end, participating in all the fundraising acts, aspects. Um, if you have a dull and boring host, Oh, I believe that your audience will be bored as well. And that means they're going to tune out and then you might be kissing your fundraising uh, goals uh, goodbye. I also truly feel, Nicole, that a, a great host has to be completely invested, um, and not just in your cause, but in delivering an exceptional show. That means they have to really understand their responsibilities. I am a stickler for name pronunciations, major donors, people in the audience. Um, I have to be able to pivot and adjust when I'm live. There could be a technical aspect. There could be something. But I have to be able to seamlessly recover and not have the audience even feel that. Um, and being really prepared is a huge, huge deal. You don't want a host just flying into the show, grabbing a piece of paper and going, okay, where's my teleprompter? And off I go. Um, these folks are representing your brand. Um, they have to respect your donors. They have to respect your audience. Um, you know, I honestly believe that when you relinquish the microphone to somebody, you could be putting your charity brand at risk. So please think very, very carefully about that. It should be a very careful process selecting your host. Um, consider the fit and the match. Um, consider their experience. And Nicole, the last thing I'm going to say is, uh, you know, organizations need to budget for this role. Yeah, so folks, there is only one lane, and you absolutely live up to your title of the auctionista. Lane's energy is infectious, and for over 10 years, they have helped folks part with more money than they ever imagined and feel really good about it, whether it's that $25 gift or, as Lane would say, that $50,000 gift. Lane's true passion for the cause is as immense as their focus on achieving that fundraising target. Lane is absolutely absolutely highly skilled and a dynamic performer and masterful at their craft. Lane brings that same excitement, improv, and energy to the virtual format, which you absolutely need. Lane, firstly, how do you do it? At in-person events, you are hopping on and off the stage, interacting and inspiring guests, working face-to-face -face with the audience, and driving bids and donations. So tell us, Lane, about some of your trademark skills that you bring to live fundraising. It must be completely different than doing your thing live. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> Not really. Um, thank you so much, Nicole. You know, I, I think everybody who knows me and everybody who's been on the show so far uh, knows that I have a naturally animated personality. And... Uh, 
uh, you know, for me, Nicole, it's, it, it's the cause, right? I have a passion for the cause. I have a passion for philanthropy. I really care deeply about my charity clients and, um, you know, that, that has not changed. Nothing has shifted there. But really, when it comes to my comfort uh, in virtual, I attest that really to, uh, I, I, at this point, I've got over a thousand live fundraising events under my belt, uh, multiple TV appearances. I've been on radio. I've done so many keynote uh, speaks on multiple talk, po topics. Um, so really, it's kind of an evolution of my live and my on-air experience. So I actually feel like pretty comfortable in the uh, in this virtual space. So really, when the when the camera light goes on, I get excited, um, and you can see that my, my excitement has been ramping up during this show. So even though I know I have a very very serious job to accomplish with fundraising, I want to have fun because when Lane has fun, everybody has fun, and when the audience has fun, they are relaxed and at ease. And that, my friends, is when they open up their hearts and give. So virtual lane really is no different than live lane. Um, I also, you know, have uh, improv skills that I've developed over the last decade. So w when it comes to technical glitches or things shifting, um, you know what? I just glide through that like it's nothing. It's just baby food. I just go through because I truly trust my performance instincts because I've been doing this for so long. So I also have the natural ability to fill airtime, as you can see. Um, I've invested the time to understand the cause, the charity's mission, so I'm infusing that language. I'm talking about why we're here. I'm, I'm infusing that cause-connected narrative uh, and in that improvised humor. So, you know, now, um, you know, we're doing live auctions as well. You know, fun to need is very emotional, so the audience will see emotional lane, very uh, moved. And then, you know, we can head into a live auction, and that's where I can bring all that excitement, all that high-octane stuff that everybody uh, loves to watch. And, you know, being an interactive performer, um, this, this is where all the comfort comes from. Fundraising technology. Hey, kids. I've been using this for years in live events, so I'm very, very accustomed. I'm very comfortable with it, and I have, you know, developed my own methodology, my tactics, and and, and ways that I I leverage that technology and 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 how can I say that, to, to maximize audience participation. Um, so these are some of the secret sauce things that uh, I do. I mean, I love virtual events. Um, you know, it, it, it's my new world. Um, I can still be myself. Um, and I know this may sound a little crazy to some people, but seriously, when the, when the camera comes on, I can literally feel the love and support coming from the audience. I know that sounds a little nutty, but um, that actually still drives my energy, Nicole. So um, back over I'm, to I'm, me. I'm, I'm, it's good. It's all really good. <laughs> <laughs> so, Lane, I really cannot say enough about how honored I am to have had our paths crossed this year. Um, in the face of COVID-19, um, when we reached out to you originally, as I said, um, it was just an undeniable reputation that you had. And so we could not be more grateful to you for living up to that and more. I would like to just give one last comment about you and the role that you play for charities, whether it is in this virtual space or for when one day we get back to those in-person events. You are just this perfect collision of two worlds coming together, that world of auctioneering as well as the development world of fundraising. You understand who is in the room and combine that with your connection to the cause and you are working with being this cr incredible amb ambassador. So thank you, Lane, uh, for the amazing talent and knowledge that you bring when you become part of the team and, as I say, family for us. That's what any host or fundraising auctioneer should bring to the table. So, all right, let's shift focus again to tech. Kevin Hare is the owner of Kevin Hare Photography and was instrumental in the production of Patient Stories and, for lack of a better word, really compiling all of our video content. Karen Zinn is the co-owner of Multitech Audiovisual and her and her husband, Vons, were the ex experts behind ensuring our event looked live the whole way through. You will now hear from both of these experts on all things tech. Kevin Hare is the owner of Kevin Hare Photography. He offers a wide range of photography and videography service for any size business, charitable organizations, and the tourism and retail industry. 
Services include small to large video production, event photography coverage, and corporate headshots. He loves what he does, and because he's able to be creative and help businesses and organizations reach their goals by creating impactful professional media in line with their brand. His contributions to the Power of Giving virtual gala included video production, which was team member interviews and patient stories, video editing, which consisted of color correction and color grading, motion graphics and transitions, and our full video production of all pre-recorded segments. His skills and experience in media production allowed him to keep things on time and on budget without having to hire multiple specialists, which can slow down the process. Having experience in many fields and industries allows him to bring new and creative ideas to every project. Instead of the typical one fund and need donation moment we see at our in-person events, we broke that mold and incorporated two live fund and need fundraising segments within our 45 minute virtual show. These segments were 100% donation focused and then we proceeded each of these segments with a very powerful empathy building video, one which was produced by Fly Press Films and one that Kevin produced for us. Fundraising is founded on storytelling and building empathy, trust and connection through those first person testimonials. At our in-person galas, we, are, we have grateful patients deliver their story live on stage. There is this visceral connection because we are gathered together and we can feel that human connection. Now that we're going virtual, we need to translate that heartfelt patient story 100% visually and create this intense impact in this virtual environment effectively and to build the inspiration that leads ultimately to those donations. So welcome, Kevin. Uh, it's great to have you here with us today, and thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and experience with us. Uh, Kevin, you were instrumental in the video production for the Power of Giving virtual gala, but I really want to hone in on that grateful patient story. Can you share with us some of the tech techniques you used when we were looking at that impactful video moment? So color, sound, lighting, and even the length of the video itself? Color, lighting, and sound all play a role in creating something visually appealing and impactful. Keeping colors accurate and avoiding anything overly creative will keep the viewer's attention on the person telling their story. Depending on the type and mood of the story, dramatic, more overhead lighting may be desirable, but generally large, soft light sources with a hair light will keep focus on your subject. Sound may be the most important but often overlooked aspect of an impactful video. Hearing every bit of emotion in someone's voice is very captivating. The length of your video should be as long as it needs to be to tell a great story, but not so long that you lose your audience's attention. Excellent insight, Kevin. Thank you. There's a lot of work that goes into ensuring a really great viewing experience uh, for a virtual gala. Can you tell me something about uh, how you pulled all of the production together to keep everyone engaged until that critical fund and need moment? Consistency is key, whether you've got one consultant or several working on your project. Having clear technical branding theme outlines will speed up the editing process and reduce back and forth communications. Keeping audio levels, video transitions, color temperatures consistent will ensure a smooth viewing experience. Most, if not all, these things will go unnoticed when done correctly, but will be very obvious when done incorrectly, which is why it's crucial to hire an experienced production company to work on your project. So Kevin, one final question for you. What is the one thing that charities should consider when they're looking to a videographer for services, when they're looking at a powerful impact video for their virtual events? It's really important that you vet your production company. You look at their previous projects, who they've worked with before. I would even get references. Um, it's really important that you spend some time with them. Make sure that you're compatible, that you have similar visions and styles. Uh, you're going to spend a lot of time communicating with them. So it's really important that you guys work together well. Kevin, thank you so much for sharing your insights today. And of course, for filming all of the interviews today. Contact information for Kevin Hare Photography will be available at the end of the show. Next, I sit down with our AV company to talk all things tech. Can you believe I am talking tech? Karen and Vaughn's out of Multitech Audiovisual in Barrie, Ontario are the people to do it. Our virtual gala consisted of two major segments, the 12 minute pre-show and the 54 minute main show. The pre-show was comprised of voiceovers, pre-recorded video messages and visual instructions on how to register, bid and donate. 
The main show also included these same aspects and the added complexity of two live fundraising segments with Lane. Karen Zinn is the co-owner of Multitech Audio Visual Inc. Along with husband Vons, they bring over 30 years of live event expertise to the business. MTAV is a full service audiovisual production company that supports both live and virtual events. Both Vaughn's passion for sound and Karen and Vaughn's desire to, meet, to be more involved in their community, they expanded in services and relocated the business to Barrie in 2015. Their services include entertainment services and event production and a rental department open to the public. Recently, they quickly pivoted due to COVID-19 and opened a professional virtual venue and recording studio. MTAV is committed to providing professional state-of-the-art AV equipment and outstanding technical services. Karen is involved in all aspects of the business and in March of 2020, Karen was presented with the prestigious 2020 Women of the Year Trades Award by the Barry Chamber of Commerce. So Karen, welcome and thank you for sharing your expertise today. I know for myself, when I think of audiovisual services at in-person events, I think custom lighting, high quality sound, but when it came to going virtual, I had no idea about the specialized virtual expertise Multitech Audiovisual would bring to our project. Karen, would you give us an overview of how you and your team at Multitech Audiovisual helped put our virtual gala together? Thanks, Nicole. It's so great to be here with you today. First of all, we were very excited about working with the GBGH team again and thrilled that the committee was up for the challenge to move the main event online. We took the time to fully understand the vision for the virtual gala, the goal as far as the look and feel, and what were the critical elements. Fundraising was at the forefront of this virtual gala, so we immersed ourselves into understanding the Givergy platform and researched the handful of virtual galas that were emerging online to determine a recommended do's and don'ts list. Working closely with GBGH, Lane and Givergy, we set out to uniquely integrate the fundraising software to maximize fundraising and the engagement. We've invested in the technology that enabled us to provide GBGH with a production that was both high resolution for audio and video and could broadcast without issues. We had Lane into our studio about a month prior to the live broadcast to pre-record hosting elements and voiceovers. Lane is such a pro and a pleasure to work with, completing all pre-recorded segments in under two hours. It has never been more important for a host to look directly into the camera to engage a virtual audience. Lane's preferred setup had the teleprompter positioned directly under the camera to achieve this. Additional monitors were provided to Lane to view the live stream broadcast like you at home to feel connected to the show and to view the auction software in order to react in real time during the live fund and need segments. My role as a floor manager was to cue Lane to the live segments and to connect to the technical team in the control room in order to put Lane to deliver the best possible performance. The Runner Show. This is the event roadmap and it is a crucial element for a well-executed virtual event. The GBGH team did an incredible job putting this information together. This detailed document breaks down the event right to the minute, including the contact the content order, introduction sequences, and live segments. This is the document that the videographer Kevin Hare, Lane, GBGH committee, and MTAV used to build the show. Our team gathered and assembled the pre-show content, the patient stories, donor videos, sponsor loops, as well as the entertainment segments from Chantel Craviats to add to our broadcast software. We use vMix software, which is a more stable and flexible broadcasting application compared to an open source software. It allowed us to easily transition seamlessly between the pre-recorded content and the live. As much as we are a technical team, we pride ourselves on being creative. We were able to add final touches with music and video overlays for a more polished production. Event day rehearsals is another key element to ensure a successful event. With Lane back in the studio, we ran through the show together with our technical team, testing the switches, the cue, and the streams. We worked hard on our end to create the perception that Lane's portions was live through the entire show. 
On show day, extra care is taken to make sure that the lighting, the backdrop position, the camera settings and the framing all match the pre-recorded content. After the rehearsals, everything was perfect and ready to go. I still remember the high level of anticipation and excitement in the room. A great deal of work goes into event development. Virtual is no different. The live broadcast went out without a single hiccup. This was the perfect virtual gala. And we were really proud to be a part of the GBGH team and help them exceed their fundraising goals. Thanks, Karen. Great information. And to our participants today, we will make sure that we provide you with MTAV's contact information at the end of the show. Yes, that was a lot of technical information in a very short period of time. This process of figuring out tech took us several months and many, many conversations. So I would say to any organization considering this, do not chance the technical portion. I thought I'd make really clear what the role of Kevin versus MTAV was because we get the most questions about that part. So Kevin filmed patient stories, donor segments, sponsor videos, committee members, and other speakers. He created the how-to videos for registration. He worked with Jen on all of the sponsor slides and the other slide decks, and he assembled all of the pre-recorded content into three videos that he delivered to MTAV, created video handoff split screen segments to aid in the perception of that live event, and then Karen and MTAV filmed all of Lane's pre-recorded segments in their studio, which we're in today, facilitated those rehearsals in studio, and made sure that there was this seamless transition the night of from live to pre-record. They managed the streaming of the show, which I might add was absolutely perfect, and coordinated the auction platform. And they ensured the preferred placement of picture-in-picture -picture for Lane and the thermometer. Awesome. All right, Nicole, before we take a couple of audience questions, I do have a question for you about the virtual gala committee. I mean, you brought together these two in-person event committees. Uh, how, how did these folks respond when you said, hey, we're going virtual? <laughs> yeah, you know what, Lane? Some were okay with the new format, um, but others did not see how they fit into the new model, and that was absolutely okay. But we wanted to make sure everyone felt as included as they wanted to be part of it. So we focused our committee and both the hospital and foundation boards to help with registration and what we called audience development, as I had mentioned previously. And of course, we had those contests to see who could send it out to the most people and continue to push registrations. So. Awesome, awesome. Okay, what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna take a couple of audience questions. Come on, give me something on screen, kids. Let's see something. All right, do you think all events in 2021 should be planned as being virtual? I know my answer, Nicole. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I would say that Going into 2021, we at the foundation are going to plan for what we know. We know we had a successful virtual event for 2020. And so honestly, Lane, I would say that at the end of the day, we are going to plan to go virtual next year. That way we can budget for it, plan for it, keep it safe, yeah. and just move forward in virtual. Exactly, exactly. All right, next question. Do we have another one? Do we have one? Do we have another one? Here it comes. We're thinking of doing a live auction during our virtual gala. Is it worth it? Is it worth it? And how would we do it? Shall I take this one? Yeah, absolutely. Yes, <laughs> it's worth it. And it can be done and it can be done very, very well. So what I'm going to tell you guys out there is you, you, you can't think typical in person when it comes to virtual. Here we're talking about a 45 minute main show for a virtual gala. That's your speed, sweet spot. You got to dump in those two fund needs. And so your live auction component can still be involved and still be included. But I would like trim that down to three fantastic items. And those items, let me just touch on that really quickly. Super broad appeal. Um, make sure um, the, the, the fair market values of those items are gonna resonate with the wallet capacity of your audience, okay? Very important. Um, you know, you've gotta think about some of these new hot uh, live auction items, virtual experiences, maybe even some tangible goods. We are going back to that, kids. So these fundraising platforms, they're ready. They're already set up uh, for live auctions. 
And so just make sure um, that the person that's doing your live auction understands how that technology works. All right, um, Nicole, oh my gosh, we're, <laughs> we're approaching the end of this event. And, and, uh, and now it's time for thoughts and reflections. Um, so I'm going to hand it to you, like, wrap it all up for me. Yeah, so some final thoughts for sure. Um, I really believe that COVID did give us some gifts. Um, and that one of those gifts was the opportunity to break the mold. So um, try things differently, change things up. Um, the skill set of my team was expanded, which was incredible. The team never said no, and it was always, how can we do this? And that actually included our volunteer committee and our boards. We raised more funds with less expense. We increased donor acquisition in this model. We changed the feeling of events from a party to being fundraising focused. We now have patient stories in video that live on longer and help the mission. People gave when they heard others' names being called and wanted to be part of something. And feedback actually was that people preferred this way, um, which was a surprise to us. And connecting at home in their PJs as a fellow introvert, I can add absolutely appreciate that. And so for, um, and who knows, as we mentioned, what next year will bring, but we are going to plan to do virtual. And at the end of the day, have a successful virtual again, event again. Exactly. So, you know, reflecting now, Nicole, and I think that you would agree with me, <laughs> any potential risks that we identified at the beginning of this uh, venture never transpired. Um, we actually went against the grain. We were, um, you know, doing a virtual event on a Saturday mm -hmm. night in August, and, um, you know, we were worried about, you know, are we going to bring in the audience? Are they going to be with us that night? But the outpouring of support has been incredible. Yeah. Not only that night, but it has continued. I also love the whole attitude. Attitude and action is everything. You never said, no, we can't do this. You said, <laughs> how can we do this? And of course, in my fundraising head, I always think about stewardship, right? Uh, for me, the increased donor act uh, um, acquisition speaks to, I mean, your organization's reputation, uh, your ongoing stewardship practices. People want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. People support people. People want to see other people succeed. And people want to be asked to help. So please remember, ask directly, ask confidently, because a soft ask is a no ask. So, uh, Nicole, congratulations to you and your team and your committee. I mean, I really, truly believe that you were already set up for success for this virtual uh, gala because of the best practices you and the foundation team had in place way before. You know your donors, you know your community, and that is why you've succeeded. So, I, I, Nicole, we're at the end of this event. I, 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 it's crazy. <laughs> did we squeeze a lot of stuff in here in 60 minutes? Heck, yes, we did. Nicole, thank you for co-hosting today. I am so grateful to you. I'm grateful to the foundation team. Uh, friends, the GBGHF team opened up their books for you today in the spirit of collaboration and community. I am deeply grateful to Nicole for her sense of duty to the charitable sector. Folks, we're going to share Kevin Hare Photography's information and Multitech Audio Visual on screen shortly. We are going to follow up with an email with everybody uh, with the case study. It's incredible. It's got everything that you need in there. And we're also going to give you a link to the Power of Giving Virtual Gala show. Make sure you watch it from top to bottom. It is worth every single second. All right. Who wants to win an hour with Nicole and myself? All right, Nicole, draw the winning name. Who's going to get to hang out with? Who's going to get to hang out with us? And it is... Janet Fairbridge, I think you're at Hospice Georgian Triangle. Uh, Janet Fairbridge, uh, we're going to be in touch with you, and you're going you're gonna to get to hang out with us. All right, kids, thank you very much. Thank you for being with us. Go forth and have the best day ever. Thank you. <laughs>